this guy had a bibliography, or this guy had a, a theory, and it ended up with this guy's bibliography. Now it's starting to become a fact. And um, also some of the more revered books, and this I, I, I know for a fact because of what I went through, books like uh, uh, Black Elk Speaks, A Wooden Lake, um, they spoke their language. Told an interpreter, who told it to uh, an English speaking person, and they wrote what they thought was said. And no chance to proofread it, no chance to change anything or, or uh, anything that was misinterpreted. Where, with working with three of his brothers, um, it was six months of corrections, and sometimes uh, I felt there was no light at the end of the tunnel. So I know that for a fact. Uh, that was after I worked with him for 12 years. So um, after I read all these, I became very interested in Crazy Horse. Became kind of a hero to me. Um, and being a documentary filmmaker, which is nothing more than somebody that doesn't have the money to make a feature film, <laughs> I was working on a script. So I wanted to uh, get the real names of the women that raised Crazy Horse, but they weren't any of the books. So, um, so I figured, well, that's 125 years ago. Somebody knows. And so um, I got back on the internet in 2001. I found uh, uh, somebody on the Cheyenne River Reservation, which is in between Standing Rock and Pine Ridge. And um, he said he knew some people that knew the names of the women that raised crazy horses. That's all it took. I said, okay, let's make an appointment, let's get together. And I flew out to Rapid City and, and, and got in the car and went to Cheyenne River. And he stood me up. So now I had three days on my hands with nothing uh, to do. So I thought, well, I've just been studying the history of, of uh, the code and crazy horse, uh, not the cultural and spiritual. And there was a, a, a place called Bear Butte. And um, so I, I decided, well, I'm, I'm going to go out there and see what's out there. Um, I figured all the spirituality be at the top. Well, halfway up, my dad spoke to me. He'd been gone for three years, but he spoke to me. And he said, open your heart. And I knew what that meant. I needed to know the cultural and spiritual side of the uh, Lakota, or else I would not be qualified to make a documentary to write a book, to even discuss it. And so um, I went home. I read all the cultural books and all the spiritual books on Lakota. They all had the ceremonies in them. They all said the ceremonies are this way. This is the only way. There's no other way. And they were all different. <laughs> and so um, I, I decided to go back out there to uh, South Dakota. and. Um, I went to uh, Bear Butte again, and I met uh, the head ranger there, who's a Dakota. His name is Jim Jandro. He's still there. And um, I was explaining how I wanted to know the cultural and spiritual, uh, more about uh, the Lakota, more about it. And uh, also the names of crazy horses, moms. I spent a whole year working on this script, and I really put everything I had into it. Um, I mean, this was for my dad. Dying wish. And so, you know, I, I really worked at it and I agonized over every sentence and word. And, and um, so uh, he said, Yeah, I, I, I got something for you. Went back to his office and, and uh, brought out uh, Floyd's younger brother, Doug War Eagle's number. So I called him and he said, Yeah, we've been waiting for your call. We knew you were coming from the West. I didn't, I didn't tell him I was coming from the West. But an invitation, so I went out there with my script in my hand. Um, I, I handed it to him. Uh, he read three words on it, threw it on the table, said, this is garbage. <laughs> and um, I, I pretended like it wasn't her. <laughs> and uh, I, I had on there, uh, you know, the, the crazy horse was the Kalala, and he wasn't, he was in the you, but there were many other problems with it. Um, so, uh, he said, we'll tell you the true story if you have a good heart. So I was wondering, how, how am I going to show that? I've only got a few hours here. He said, we'll take you to the sweat lodge. I said, oh, good. I, I 
really hot time. So I went outside, the wood started up the fire, and saw people bring wood. So I thought, well, I'll join them, I'll brought some wood. And I was running with the wood, and then I was sprinting with the wood, and pretty soon they all started standing back and watching me. And um, I remember their uncle saying, this guy kind of scares me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was over the top with enthusiasm. <laughs> went in there, went in the sweat lodge, it was a great experience. I, it, I really, really liked it. Uh, those of you who have been in the sweat lodge, you know what I'm talking about. Those who haven't, I would highly recommend it. Afterwards, I was listening to see how my heart had done. And the silence was deafening. And so we went inside and we were eating. And I have to say, you know, I, I wish I knew your language. I would have sang with you because I felt that good. And um, that same uncle, now he hadn't gone in the sweat lodge. He just brought in the hot rocks on the pitchfork and up and closed the doors. But he never got in. He said, you know, they don't let me in there because I sing Merle Hanger. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I realized that I had been accepted with that statement that crushed the eggs that I, I felt I was walking on. And um, for the next 12, 12 years, we went out to all the oral history sites. They have a landmark or a reference point. Uh, I, I put them, uh, I took my camera and uh, took pictures of them for relatives that, that couldn't be there, couldn't make it out there. And, um, also to put them into a, a documentary, which is uh, six hours, it's a four part documentary. So. That's an all-day project. Um, <laughs> and um, what I learned during this time is they knew their genealogy better than anybody I'd ever met. And it made me feel like I needed to know mine better. Our, our book is in Norwegian and German. And so we got called to a Norway uh, by the publisher to come over. And um, I was able to find my Norwegian roots. And in Sweden, I found uh, a family that my parents and grandparents didn't even know. So that was kind of emotional for me. And it was a setting just like this. Um, so I have a hard time getting through that. Um, I wasn't always supposed to write this book. Uh, that was another gentleman that was supposed to write it. But he got called to Afghanistan, so they offered, or they offered it to me. I was honored, and I, I accepted it. I accepted it. Uh, it's, it's in the first person, um, just the way they told it to me. And I tried to leave as, as light a footprint as I could. That's why uh, I had final say on everything. Um, as far as the spirituality, I wasn't 100% convinced. Um, and one day, <coughs> Floyd was building a new sweat lodge. And he said, the whole Lakota Nation is going to sweat in there. And I looked at that, and I thought to myself, that's kind of a tough fit. Um, and so uh, we went in there, and there'd be 10 of us, and there'd be 12 of us in there. This can't be the whole nation. But I didn't say anything. I never said anything about it like that. And then, um, and then one day, I uh, went in there, and these five Lakota men came out of the rocks. They didn't acknowledge me. They just they had a blanket over their shoulder. And uh, over the shoulders, and they faced the rocks except for the one on the left. He was in profile. In the sweat loss, there's four rounds. There's a, uh, it goes dark, and they open the door, light, dark, light. So in the first time it went dark, was when I saw them. So when they opened the door and the light came in and it disappeared, I changed my position a little bit. I thought, well, maybe I'm just sitting just right to see that. And um, they closed the door again, and they came back. So they came back the second round, the third round, the fourth round. So by this time, I was very excited. The ceremony was going on. I didn't say anything, but inside, I was just bumping all over. And um, afterwards, I, I, I came up to Floyd, and I said, Floyd, I I know what you're talking about. This was after the sweat was over. I know what you're talking about. I understand how the whole nation can be in there. I understand now. He said, yeah, we know what you saw because you doubted us. So they showed themselves. And so I always remember that. Um, I close my
eyes and see it uh, pretty much every time. It, it's indelible. The person on the left, two years later, there had been a book out of print. That was not one of the 300 I had read. It was a book called Custer's Conquer by William Bordeaux. And um, there was a drawing. And the drawing was of Pagula, old man crazy horse. So that's the person that was on the left. I, I, as soon as I saw it, I knew that was the person. Um, this journey, the last 20 years, I couldn't think of a better journey to have been on for the last 20 years. Um, when my dad asked me to do this, I started out thinking it was an obligation, but um, now I realize it was a gift. So, um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Floyd, our clown senior. Grandson of Crazy Horse and Administrator of Crazy Horse State. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Um, when we were told to do this, um, uh, 2001, but for our family, it started in 1990 um, when this Hornell Brewing Company that made the Crazy Horse small liquor, uh, this is what the Crazy Horse Estate took to federal court in 1990. But um, before it went to court, my father, who's in front of the book, Edward Clown, he was the pipe keeper for the Crazy Horse family. So the work that he did on this court case to where we won this case, 2001, um, the work that he done on this case, which wanted, but he never got to see this go to federal court because he was left for the other side in 1987. So three years later, this went to federal court in 1990 with the Harnell Brewing Company. 2001, in this federal court case, um, the federal judge awarded it back to the family, the name, everything, um, <coughs> um, pertaining to my grandfather's name. And this is when, 2001 was when we were told it was time for truth now. Uh, no more assumptions. So grandson, tell them who you are. So. I stood up for my father in this court case, and um, the federal judge said, before this court case is done, we must determine the blood heirs of the Crazy Horse estate. So uh, 2001, in this court case, we showed a blood tree on the paternal side of our family, Crazy Horse's family, where we showed where my dad was and where I was. And because that's how the government looks at us on a paternal side of the, our, our families, the male side, uh, this is what we showed in federal court. Because we knew that the acting administrator at that time, 2001, we knew he wasn't from our family. And federal law says that if you're gonna be an administrator of an estate, you have to be blood from that estate. That's federal law. So uh, when we showed this blood tree in this federal court case, at that time, nobody in this world had ever seen the blood tree of my grandfather, paternal. So uh, when this acting administrator looked at this blood tree and that he wasn't on there, he said, I'm on the maternal side, the mother's side. So we showed the maternal side of the blood tree of my grandfather, Crazy Horse. And when he looked at this, uh, he seen that he wasn't on there either. So since 2001 to now, uh, we're still waiting for, um, at that time, 2001, the federal judge appointed three administrators. So I was appointed administrator for Shine River uh, Agency or Reservation. That's where the blood family's from. So I was appointed as administrator for my blood family from Shine River. And at that time, they recognized uh, Pine Ridge Administrator and Rosebud Administrator. So um, 2001, the federal judge said, um, when he's seen these blood trees, Pine Ridge, Rosebud Administrators, you need to make a blood tree like what Shine River did. And uh, this is what we've been waiting on since 2001 to now. So waiting for their proof of their blood identity to our family. 
And um, um, when uh, 2001, uh, when we were told to do uh, stand up for my grandfather, um, under the federal law, what they recognize as a legal blood tree, you have to use six documents. And uh, the first document is a probate, which is a death certificate. And in our research, we found that um, they didn't keep probates of our people till 1904 and five is when they start keeping probates of our people, which is a death certificate. And before these probates, uh, when, they were, when we were put on these federal agencies, um, because the federal government, when they made these federal agencies, they made them by blood families. So they recognize enrollment and allotment of these federal agencies as uh, proof of your identity by blood. And then uh, before these federal agencies, uh, they recognize census, ration listing, and church records as legal documents proving your identity under the federal law. So 2001, this is what we used, these six documents, to make the blood tree for my grandfather, Crazy Horse, paternal and maternal. So this is what, uh, at that time, Pine Ridge and Rosebud administrators, you, didn't, you need to make a legal blood tree. Because at that time, they were bringing books. In the back of these books, there's a, do I have a tree, unknown, and like this on these books. So the federal judge said, that's a tentative tree. Anybody could do that, just write names in. And what a, what's a legal tree, you have to have a birthday and you have to day, have a, a day of your death or demise. And then you have to show proof with these six documents. So this is what the administrators for Pine Ridge and Rosebud were told to do. And um, our family, um, when we went into hiding, it was 1877 till 2001. Nobody knew of our family. So everybody that had been claiming my family and grandfather had had 20, 124 years to show their proof who they are, what they've been claiming. And, um, and then 18 years after that, so really, everybody is, has had 142 years to show their proof what they've been assuming you know, for the last 142 years. And uh, so when we were told to do this 2001, when my grandfather said, it's time for truth, no more assumptions, my grandfather just said, assumption is when you make something up, a story or anything. And then after all, when you tell it for so long, after all, you think it's true when it's not the truth. That's an assumption. So 2001, uh, when we showed this blood tree in this federal court case, there were 3,000 blood family on the paternal and maternal side of my grandfather, Crazy Horse. So as administrator, this is who I represent, 3,000 blood family that I speak for. and. Um, 2001, when we were told to stand up and tell our identity, who we are, um, my grandfather, they said, uh, they're going to send us help from the four directions. And this is where Bill came from the west direction. He came from Portland, Oregon. And the one that was supposed to write the book for us, he came from North Carolina. His name was Kevin Dida. But when we were getting, because 2001, when we showed this blood tree to the blood family of 3,000, a lot of them didn't know they were of the family because their parents, grandparents, never told them their true identity, who they were, because we were in hiding. And it's better if they don't know, they're not going to say nothing. And like that, so they kept it from them. So 2001, when we showed this blood tree to the blood family, uh, this is where the blood family appointed me and my two younger brothers as administrators 
to represent the blood family. So my younger brother, Doug War Eagle, and our youngest brother, Don Red Thunder, um, were, those are my younger brothers that are administrators for the Crazy Horse family and myself. But in this federal court, I'm the administrator representing the Crazy Horse family in this federal court. But um, when we um, showed this tree to the Blood family and seen that a lot, a lot of the family didn't know who they, they were until they seen this blood tree that they're a grandson or a granddaughter or maternal side, you know, um, cousin or like this. They were of the family. So this is when we decided to make a book for our children and grandchildren. Why it took us 12 years to verify our family's oral history. And the stories that we were told always had a, a landmark or a point of reference when that event happened. So this is what we were doing for 12 years, verifying our oral history. Because when the Lakota families hand down their oral histories, it was with truth. When you hear a story of the family, you have to tell it exactly how you, you heard it. You can't add on or you can't take away from that story. You have to tell it with truth. So this is how, uh, what we were verifying. And uh, whenever we found a landmark uh, or a point of reference, when that event happened or like this, sometimes we'll pinpoint exactly where the family was camped at that time. But whenever we found out that it was a truth, that's when we put it in the book. Because this is being done for our children and grandchildren. Because we wanted them to know their identity of their grandfathers and grandmothers, where their blood came from. So uh, this is why it took us 12 years to put together. But um, when we were getting ready uh, to get this published, when we were getting done with this book, our grandfather said, uh, share it with the world. Um, this is where uh, they said, they used their grandfather's name around this world, so share it with the world. Why we're here today, sharing it with you guys. Um, and um, when we were told uh, to uh, share it with the world, um, this is where it's also in uh, Norwegian and German and English, and now they're working on French. Uh, there's different languages of the world, including we want it also in Lakota for our family, our people, and like this. But it was time for truth now, they said, so uh, this is what uh, we're doing for the, the family and our people and the rest of the world. So uh, when we made this book, uh, we were told there was 500 books written about my grandfather. Movies that were made about my grandfather. When we finished this book and had it published, all books written about my grandfather are now all assumptions. They're non-truth, they're fiction. So when you're looking back at this book, you're not going to find no references in the back of this book where we got these stories from. Because any book you look in the back and see references, they'll say we got this story from this book or author of this, like this, when they put a book together. This one doesn't have that. What we show back there is how we showed our proof of our identity in this federal court using these six documents. But um, when we had it published, the publisher made it real small back there. They call it postage stamps, where uh, you almost need a magnif I mean, a thick magnifying glass <laughs> to look at it. So on the first page of the appendix, on the bottom of the page, we put a link in there that you could go to, click onto that link, you could blow up all these documents as big as you want to see them. If you can't see, you could even blow them up as big as a movie theater screen. <laughs> because us, the family, we have nothing to hide, because we were told to do this with truth. So this is um, uh, what, uh, when we completed this book as truth, 
you know, all, anything written about my grandfather. If you read any books about my grandfather, all I say is good practice because uh, that's not uh, my grandfather you're reading about. So um, this is where a lot of assumptions started. When my grandfather in 1877, when he got assassinated by this government and his own kind, um, nine years later, Red Cloud was recognized as chief of the Oglala Band, nine years later. So when my grandfather was assassinated, there was no such band as the Oglala or Sichungu. These were paper tribes made by this government in 1886 and recognized by this government in 1886. So um, this is where there's a lot of assumptions. These 500 books written and the movies that were made said my grandfather is in Oglala, which didn't even exist when he got assassinated. So um, this is where, uh, as truth, um, our family, uh, my grandfather, um, this is where the world was believing. I use this as an example. What the world was believing was an English man and an English woman having a German baby. That's what the world was believing. Because his mother is Mnikoju, his father is Mnikoju, but everybody's saying he's no Glala. Same thing. When his mother and father are Mnikoju, that makes him Mnikoju, what our family is. And just like an English man, an English woman, their kids are English. You know, so this is what everybody's assuming, assumptions. So this is what we're correcting now with truth. So our family, um, 2001, when we showed our proof in this federal court case, um, at that time, 2001, this government uh, was acknowledging the Lakota and the Shans that fell at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So there were the planning stages of an Indian memorial that was dedicated in 2003. So 2001, when we went uh, to this meeting, the, the uh, reservation where we come from, Shan River, was invited up there. So they asked us to go along, the Crazy Horse family. And this is where the Red Nations up there, uh, like what they told us, everybody was Crazy Horse descended. You know, and like this, they were claiming my family and grandfather. So in this meeting of these Red Nations, this is where when we were told to tell our identity, I'm a grandson of Crazy Horse, my grandfather is Nikoju. So this is the first time that these Red Nations heard this. And after that, nobody said they were descended. Because now they know of this court case where you have to show proof now. So um, our people, they're having a hard time with this truth. Because, but when they use these six documents, this is where they're finding out they're not of our family. The blood trees that we put in this federal court case, if you're not on there, you're not of our family. So they're having a hard time with this truth. Why people shy away from truth, because sometimes truth hurts. But um, as truth, what they're finding out is that where their blood comes from, their grandfathers and grandmothers. So they're finding out their true identity, who they are, by remembering their grandfather and grandmothers, where their blood comes from. So before, by assuming they were from our family, they forgot about their grandfathers and grandmothers, where, as truth, where their blood comes from. So when we were told to do this with truth, um, this was also going to, with truth, help heal our people. So as truth, we know that their grandfathers and grandmothers are happy they weren't forgotten because that's what the people were doing. They forgot about their grandfathers and grandmothers by assuming they were of our family. 
So now uh, they started to find this out. So um, at, when we were at Little Bighorn, um, when they, we told who we were, uh, the Park Service asked us to stay another day. So the next day when we went to the administration building and met with the superintendent, and there were three former superintendents of, of the uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield Park Service were also there. And uh, this is where they asked us. They had two tables like this sitting the long way, and they had a map of the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Their curators, their historians, and like that were all sitting with documents by the soldiers. In 1876, every soldier had a journal. In this journal, they were writing what they were seeing, what they were experiencing, and like this, in their journals. And that's what they were sitting with. So when we told how our grandfathers did this, at that time, the Park Service said, there's over a thousand books written about this battle by the Cheyenne, by the Crow, by the, anybody else that had been writing books about this battle. So when we told them that this camp at the battle, it was six miles of camp, already these thousand books said there was only three miles of camp. So they were already assuming you know, these books that were written when there was six miles of camp. And when we told how, we even told them how they were all camped. And when we told them how our grandfathers did this battle, it matched up to everything the soldiers were writing in their journals, what they were seeing. So they knew that we were telling them the truth. Because in 1877, when our family went in hiding, the story of this battle went in hiding with our family. So um, when uh, we told them and they matched to everything the soldiers wrote, <coughs> the historians had two questions they wanted to ask us. They said in 1984, a fire came through this battlefield and it burnt 600 of the 640 acres of this battlefield, burnt the grass off completely. And, um, when that happened, they said, uh, we noticed there was rocks below Last Daniel. So we looked at our, because there were river rocks, what they were seeing. So they, they checked their geographic maps and they, and they said, according to our geographic maps, there's supposed to be no rocks in this area. So this is where we told them that this is the only battle that the Lakota told the Lakota and the Cheyennes. When you move, remove your relative or your family member from this battlefield, bring a rock from the river and mark where they fell. So uh, they're called carns. They were markers, what they were seeing. And then uh, the other question was, in 1984, when the grass was burnt off, forensics came through this battlefield, like a crime scene they documented every shell casing and like this they found in this battlefield. So they said um, with the computer, because a shell casing with a firing pin mark on it is like a thumbprint. It's one of a kind. So with the computer, with these shell casings all documented, we could tell where a person shot from. That same shell casing, we'll find it over here and like this. So with a computer, we could simulate how the Lakota and the Cheyenne were coming, shooting, like this. And then we could tell what the soldiers were doing, skirmish lines and retreating and like this. And like that, so um, when, when we could look at it like that on a computer today, you know, the technology and like this. So, but uh, in 1984, when the forensics came through here, um, they found two soldier skeletons. So they said, uh, the historian said, um, according to our records, we're still missing 26 soldiers. So we took the superintendents and the historians down to Deep Ravine. 
According to our family's oral history, there's nine buried right here. We showed them where they were buried. And they said, no, in 1984, when the forensics came through here, they scanned everything. They didn't find this. And then as the historian was looking at the paperwork, he realized that in 1984, when they scanned that area, they set that machine right on top of those nine that were buried. <laughs> so they never scanned where they were standing. They scanned all the way around them, but where these nine were buried. And then we took them to Sharpshooter Ridge, and we showed them where 17 were buried on Sharpshooter Ridge. So now all your soldiers are accounted for, 26 that he was missing. And now it's our turn. And up there, um, um, there's a red headstone starting to mark the Lakota and the Cheyennes that fell at this battle. Because they know these rocks are corns, they're markers. And like this, so um, the Park Service gave our family, and the historian had to check us out first. And when he verified that we were the blood family and like this, uh, they gave us permission to walk the battlefield. And nobody up there gets off those trails. Because if you get off that trail, uh, you'll get thrown in jail because you're breaking the law. But uh, when we were given permission, uh, and they gave us these uh, surveyor flags, a little wire with these plastic flags. I think they were orange colored. But um, when we walked the battlefield, we marked 215 corns. So when you see these, these um, orange flags, you could see why those white headstones are where they're at. You could see this battle happening. And um, this was the first time they heard um, that how many of the Lakota and the Cheyennes fell at that battle. Um, part of the battlefield is a private land, so we marked 215 and we didn't find 35. So there was 250 total of Lakota and Cheyennes that fell at this battle, and 263 soldiers that fell at this battle. The only difference are the 13 Grey Riders that was with Custer. Um, during the Civil War, they were the most highly decorated military of the United States. Uh, they were all Congressional Medal of Honor winners and like this. Well, they were the very first to go down in this battle. But um, so these kind of truths they never heard before. Nobody has. Because when the United States in, in 1876 declared war on the Lakota nation, nobody from our nation ever told of this battle. So this is the first time they were hearing this, 2001 the real truth. And uh, when we were told to stand up for my family, it was time for truth now. So my grandfather, they said, tell them the truth. It's time to heal. So that Indian memorial that was dedicated in 2003, it was uh, unity or peace through unity or vice versa. Unity through peace. So, um, in 2003, the Crazy Horse family, we did a ride. We, we made a video of it called Journey of the Heart. Um, and um, from our family cemetery on Shannon River, we rode with the youth. And my grandfather, he always paid attention to the youth because the youth was a strength of a nation. The elders is the knowledge and wisdom of a nation why he paid, paid attention to these two groups. So 2003, when we did this ride with the youth from our family cemetery, we rode 360 miles to Little Bighorn Battlefield. But like anything that we do, there's a meaning behind that. 360 is a circumference of a circle. Why, there was a, why it was that. And we did this for four years, the Crazy Horse family, in honor of our Lakota and Cheyenne grandfathers that fell at this battle. 
But uh, when that Indian Memorial dedication was done in 2003, June 25th, June 26th was Korzak Joukowsky's wife's birthday, Ruth. So uh, when we did this ride, uh, completed this ride on the 25th, we loaded up our horses and we, we hauled them to Crazy Horse Mountain, June 26th, the Crazy Horse family. Um, <coughs> Um, we did a ride for Ruth, honoring her for her birthday. And at that time, she was 74 years old. So uh, when we did that ride, um, and uh, this is when we told her how her husband did this mountain. So before that, she said, um, um, in 1948, when Korzak uh, um, and came and met with our family, in 1948, at that time when he asked, if you do this, you gotta do it, it was private donations, no government help. So he said, I promise to do that. So when he made that promise, my dad's older brothers, three of my uncles, went up there and posed for the face of the mountain, how he'd done this sculpture. And then um, at that time, he was told, when you're done with this sculpture, you can't tell anybody how you did this. So he said, I promise to do that. So when he left for the other side in 1990-something, um, he never told anybody he kept his promise. So 2003, when we told Ruth how that mountain came to be, she told us that in 1948, she was walking down the hall. She looked in the room, and she had seen her husband doing something. And the next time she walked by and she looked in that room, um, he was sitting back and he was done with his sculpture. And the next time she walked by, he was burning something up in the fireplace. He never told me how he did this. I never asked him how he did that. So 2003, she just not heard the truth of how that came to be. So our family, we've always known that horse that my grandfather rode on, on that mountain. His name was Ia, meaning rock or spirit rock. That's the name of my grandfather's horse on that mountain. But to remember a horse that he lost before Ia, named Wakia, meaning thunder, why this sculpture is being done on Thunder Mountain in the Black Hills, to remember his horse that he lost. But only the family knew this. Now it's in a book, so everybody is starting to <laughs> know this truth. Yeah, no more assumptions. But um, so when, when we honored her and uh, her kids were standing with her and we called her Ruth. And we didn't know that up there at the mountain, even her kids call her Mrs. Z. Uh, her parking deal has Mrs. Z. All the employees call her Mrs. Z. Her own kids call her Mrs. Z. <laughs> so when we honored her, Ruth, and like this, she was all happy, giving us hugs, and like this, when we honored her for her birthday. So her kids are looking at their mom, you know, what's wrong with mom, you know, because she chews us out if we say Ruth. <laughs> and, um, and our family, we was calling her Ruth, and she didn't get upset or anything. So we were the only family, I guess, that was privileged to call her Ruth. But that's her name, Ruth. You know, so, um, but um, uh, when, when um, our family uh, up there at Crazy Horse Mountain, uh, Korzak and Ruth, they have a, a dream, a vision. Um, <clears throat> um, it's in a visitor center if you've ever been up there. Um, it shows when the mountain's complete, there's a medical university that they want to build and like this and like that. So 2001, when we got in this federal court case, at that time there was 180 companies worldwide using my grandfather's name. So uh, 2001, when we showed our blood tree in this federal court case, uh, the first company to call us was Liz Claiborne. Because at that time, she was making a crazy collection in JCPenney's. 
And um, at that time, she made 500 million net in one year using my grandfather's name. So when her lawyers called uh, 2001, I told my younger brothers, tell them I want 80% of that. <laughs> and um, when they told her lawyers that, they were surprised. <laughs> because under the federal law, by winning this court case with the Hornell Brewing Company, we're entitled to 100%, all of it. But um, we tell them that, uh, tell her that uh, we're not a greedy family. <laughs> she has employees that work for her, that's their livelihood. They depend on that to live and like this. So tell her to take care of her employees first and whatever, uh, <coughs> um, whatever is left, you can live comfortably off that. That was just one year. That's not counting from the first day she used it until she quits using it. So under the, this federal law, the name Crazy Horse that the people were using, when this court case is done, these 180 companies are watching this court case. Because we won this case, they all want to settle out of court. They all, you know, uh, with the family, the real family. So I know the United States is easy because all you have to go is to the IRS <laughs> because they all have to pay taxes. So they tell on themselves when they used it and like this. So uh, they're accountable for all 100% what they made off my grandfather belongs to my family, the Crazy Horse family. And that's one company. And uh, the first year, there was like five, six companies that called. Some of them making 300 million, 200 million, 100 million like that annually. So um, we know that our families have been in litigation for a while, but um, they're all out of court settlements that they want to do. So uh, when we were told that they were going to send help from the four directions, Bill coming from the west, from Portland, Oregon, uh, Kevin coming from the east, uh, from North Carolina, Kevin died out. The lawyers that were representing us in this determined the blood heirs of the crazy horse state, they represent the south direction. And when this court case is done, that north direction comes. And that's a lawyer that's going to international lawyer that's coming that's going to stop the use of my grandfather's name around the world. So my grandfather didn't lie when they said they were going to send help from the four directions. So this is still coming. We're slowly completing it. But um, uh, when uh, we were told to do this, uh, uh, all this um, correcting everything, I mean, it's time for truth now and like this. And um, um, when um, these lawyers come and correct things and like this, this were as truth, because that's what we were told to do. And my grandfather, Craig George, he never said you have to do it like this or like that. He showed it to you. He did it by example. And that's what the people, our nation, follow his example. And so how he does it, this is how you do it. So today, as his family, by example, we're showing all the red nations, this is how you legally protect your grandfather's name under the federal and international laws. So we're the first family to do this for the red nations. We're setting protocol for all of them. So we know that uh, when this court case is done, Sidney Moe's family, next, Geronimo's family, Chief Joseph, down the line, all these red nations, their grandfathers now have a way to protect their grandfather's name. So um, <coughs> this is where I'm, I smile when I think of Geronimo's family. Uh, look how many people jump out of planes. <laughs> And Howard Geronimo, you know, like that, you know. So, uh, you know, that's, they have to pay for that, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is uh, what um, 
by winning this court case, uh, the Cradors family, like my grandfather, uh, by example, were doing this for all the Red Nations. And so now um, they're going to have to ask the family's permission to use their grandfather's names. So now they can legally protect um, their, their, um, their grandfather. And, but for our family, um, in 1877, when my grandfather, um, why we went into hiding, my grandfather had a Sundance held um, two weeks before the Battle of Little Bighorn, which was held uh, six miles north of Lame Deer, Montana today. Um, at this sun same Sundance, this is where Sitting Bull was showing a vision of what was going to happen at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So um, today on Jack Bailey's land, north of uh, Lame Deer, Montana, six miles, there's a rock called Deer Medicine Rock. And this is where Sitting Bull's vision was put on this rock. But um, at the same Sundance, my grandfather was shown a vision too. So on the belly of an owl right west of this Deer Medicine Rock, because the owl is one of our family medicines, on the belly of this owl, he showed his vision of his demise, his death. So on the belly of this owl, he showed a doctor standing there, which was Melakuddy. My grandfather standing beside him. And in front of him was a soldier with a rifle and bayonet that stabbed him twice. And my grandfather even had to march where he got stabbed. But standing with this soldier was his own people, his own kind, meaning that the government and his own people were going to do this. And the short horse tracks up and down coming in, um, <coughs> uh, meaning that he's going to be alive coming in, but when he leaves, these horse tracks are laying down, meaning he was going to be dead when he leaves, which happened 15 months later at Fort Robinson. What happened there? He already knew this was coming. But my grandfather, because of his um, unconditional love for his family and people, he still preserved and protected the Black Hills. Because for our nation, the Black Hills is our ancestral burial grounds of our people. So what's going on there today is like, to, like a church today with a cemetery beside it. People are living all over that cemetery, driving all over it. That's what's going on right now. But, um, in 1877, the reason why my grandfather went to Fort Robinson was this federal government promised him a federal agency. You know, we'll give you a federal agency if you quit fighting, because they were scared of my grandfather. But um, this government um, in 1877, if something's not under their system, or, or if they're scared of something, or, you know, like this, this government destroyed it. So when my grandfather got assassinated, because our family knew that was an assassination, Thank you.